So thanks for joining us today for the patient experience trifecta. Today, we wanna to talk about helping people, patients, and businesses in healthcare to thrive. We wanna start though with some questions. How do you build or restart a patient experience program? Many healthcare organizations have been dabbling in PX for one reason or another and have languished or stopped or it's been deprioritized certainly in the last few years in the, during the pandemic there have been shifts that have been made and maybe immediate adoptions in technology have been required that kind of put the rest of your service design on hold but we want to talk today about how to start and really focus in on effective PX strategy. We want to talk also about how does your patient experience integrate with brand and employee engagement. Those are essential connections that need to be kept. How do you improve low marketing engagement for your service lines, your clinics, your hospitals, physician practices? And how do you maximize the impact of your marketing spend? We all know the old adage in healthcare, it's always been true, but it's especially true in 2023 is doing more with less. And how does your marketing and patient experience tie to employee engagement and the high turnover rates that we're seeing everywhere? So those are the questions that we're going to address today. If you have questions during the presentation, please drop them into the chat. We'll be happy to address them at the end. And if you're catching this on a replay, thanks for joining us. You're welcome to email us questions if you have them. So thank you. So 2023 is really going to be a year of differentiation. What does that really mean? Especially in healthcare, it's always been true. It's hard to compete on price and product. And the thing that more and more and more healthcare research system research, consumer research, patient research is indicating is that the point of differentiation for healthcare is going to be in the patient experience. How, how people are treated, how they feel, how every touch point along their journey is connected and helpful to serve their needs. So differentiating yourself in 2023 when everybody's kind of up here on products, services, all the things, we have urgent care clinics, we have a robotic arm, we have whatever, the things that are going to truly differentiate your healthcare entity are the, the more human-centric things of how is your experience designed across the board for the humans that are encountering your business. So patient experience as a whole is really a holistic approach where you're focusing on the patient, where there's a human that's in the center of the every touch point along your service delivery. And that isn't just the providers. Often this gets just assigned to the physician or clinician or medical technologist or the nursing staff, but the patient experience applies to every touch point in your organization from billing, your website, the way you answer the phone, the people who greet in the lobby, every single place that a customer interacts with your organization is part of the patient experience. There are some organizations that we work with that have decided to call every employee a caregiver, which is kind of cool because whether you work in landscaping or laundry or nursing, every bit of that organization, every colleague makes a difference in the experience and in the care that is delivered to the patients. And you all know 30 to 40% of star ratings now are focused on questions around the patient experience, around communication, around how they felt and 
how it was during the interaction with a physician, but also overall from the organization. CMS has made those changes over the last two or three years to really emphasize the patient experience. So if you're an organization that's star rated, patient experience is vital to huge volumes of your revenue. And companies, of course, across all categories, inside and outside of healthcare, but most especially in healthcare, those companies and businesses that have the highest patient experience scores are the most profitable. And that requires a focus on short-term revenue grabs, which 2023 will be all about. So many healthcare entities are, are in trouble financially coming out of the pandemic into the recession, having had to staff with massive travelers that are two or three times the cost, having had to deal with lower volumes staff departures, all of the things and pressures in healthcare are bubbling and they really are, we get it. The leadership is focused on how can we in the near term drive some revenue wins, but, and that's of course important and necessary for all of us. We all need to have money to survive. But the important thing is that that focus is not executed in absence of a long-term brand play for loyalty, for experience, for trust. Over and over throughout history, from the Great Depression forward, the 2008-9 recession, all across history, over the chaos of the last three years, it is the organizations that kept their eye on the long play while they were innovating in the short term that have come out more successful for the long run. And that is the key, the loyalty over the long run that will keep you in business and sustainable for years to come. So there, there are many studies that indicate that health consumers, that the star rating is one of the top factors for them choosing a new physician or to book an appointment with a new system or whatever. Obviously, is it covered in my health insurance? But star ratings are a big deal. And 84% of patients on one study we saw said they would not schedule with a provider or a system that has lower than a four star rating. Now I know reputation management can get the ire of providers and of executives in healthcare. And to some degree, I totally understand that. But when you are looking at your overall strategy, your brand experience, your reputation management, how are patients inside and outside of this organization being treated? How are your staff being treated? Those are critical elements to consider in the overall reputation of your brand. So we bring it up here knowing that it is a, it is a stressor and a driver to some of your success, and it can't be left off completely, but it's not the only thing. So truly great patient experience, if it's done right, there's nothing in your organization that will go untouched by it. It's going to integrate the human experience for your staff and caregivers and your patients. Often patient experience gets done in a vacuum where it's all about only the patient. But when you, when you integrate change into an organization that is only about the patient and has not considered the intersection of the staff, the culture, the leadership, your readiness, all of those things, then it typically is an unsustainable change. And so our commitment as an organization is really to help the clients that we work with to find that critical intersection of brand your brand story and your expression and your promises, where that overlaps with your culture and your employee engagement, your internal communications and the patient experience. It's in that intersection that we believe the magic happens. And really, honestly, where your long-term sustainable profitability and growth can come from. So, in the patient experience strategic process, we're gonna talk about the trifecta, the patient experience first. 
when you are either starting or maybe reviving or continuing in patient experience, we like to take a strategic approach that has three steps, big steps. The first one is really identification, making sure that you have clearly identified your current state, where you wanna go. What is your readiness as an organization? Do you have the resources? What are the goals and the key specific metrics and improvements that need to be seen? It, this doesn't mean all of this has to be tackled, but you need to be realistic about where you are as an organization. And in this step, we also work with a lot of folks that we have to help them stop and define what does the winning patient experience look like for your organization. Now that may be aspirational, but if you don't know where you're heading and what it looks like, you may end up walking and not be heading in a clear direction. So it's important in this identification stage that you identify what is your it? What is the destination of a patient experience with our organization? What does that look like? I'll give you some examples in a little bit about some case studies that we've done and what that looks like, but it's important. Identify the gaps. Where are the friction points? Where are the broken CX processes? And this particular phase is not a judgment list. It's not a, oh, we're terrible at everything. It really is about identifying where you're at realistically as an organization. You know, maybe you identify that you really need a new EHR, but you're 3 million in the hole coming out of the last two years. That's not going to be on the next step, your highest priority because your resources don't align with the finding. But I can tell you, there are big and small things in patient experience that can move the needle and make a difference for you right away. So don't get discouraged if you're like, oh, we need a new EHR, but we don't have $800,000 to implement it. Totally get it. But maybe there's a broken customer experience point that you can address that will help move you in the right direction. So the second phase of our strategic process that we that works for any organization is prioritization. And this is an area that healthcare entities, I was an executive leader in healthcare for 20 years. Holy cow, do I know about initiative overload? It is a formal diagnosis for healthcare organizations. Initiative overload, the quality gal, the med safety, the supply chain is doing this whole new initiative to help avoid waste. Everybody has an initiative, infection control, everybody, HEDIS, revenue, all the people have an initiative that they want to roll out to the staff. And the problem is that they aren't prioritized in a way that strategically moves the needle for the whole organization. It ends up trying to boil the ocean, you get spread too thin with the change du jour or the initiative du jour, and you end up with change fatigue among the staff, which impacts engagement. I know those days where I've had eight hours, nine, 10 hour days with nine meetings. It is impossible to get anything done when you can't prioritize some of the initiatives. This is part of the ultimate change management that you've got to be able to lead within your organization and the buy-in that's required. If you aren't back to identification at that readiness state in your organization, and these patient experience things are really just your, your passion bubbling up to make things better for the patient, then let's prioritize something small that you can control. So, it's important to identify what are the things that can make the biggest impact, but are within your scope of reasonability. Do you have the staff? Is it feasible to do this right now? Do you have the resources? Do you have the buy-in? Are you ready? 
you know, you may not be able to do the whole EHR my chart rollout with all the new comms initiatives, but you may be able to observe and change the way the waiting room experience is happening in your clinic. There's one clinic I went to recently and they had a clipboard on the counter, made you write your full name, your social security number, and what you're here for on a clipboard. Everybody in the room had that on there. Well, not only is that a HIPAA violation, I'm like, I am not giving you my social security number. No. And, and there were two people sitting right there at the desk that didn't look up, that just said, oh, sign that thing and kept working. It's like, okay, no, I'm not gonna provide my most personal information on this clipboard for every other person in this room to see. Two, this is a HIPAA violation. Three, hello, I'm here as a human. Look in my eyes, please. So that kind of fix wouldn't take a lot of money to do, but it would go a long way in providing a better and more human experience for people. So implementation. This is where you get to work across the organization to, um, to really begin to build buy-in and drive change. Sorry, I was trying to find out the time here. And that step requires that you can identify problems quickly, highlight the success, get some wins fast, especially if you're new on PX, especially if you are a loan or a very small team that's trying to lead the charge for your organization, those quick wins and quick demonstrable successes are really important to gain the buy-in for the future projects. So implementation can look big or small. And so this is where make sure you identify quickly what the issue is, highlight the success, talk about it loud and often. So in one case study where we, were, we have been working with a global virtual healthcare service, they work with clients from all over the world with children and their families. And they came to us and said, oh, we need to double our revenue in two years. We can't raise our prices. We're not hiring more staff. Okay, no problem. And that's almost always how all of these conversations start is we need more money. But often at the root of more money is this experience and the brand. So in our review, in our assessment of them, we identified their brand was talking so medicalized and so over the head of their client. And the moms and the dads and the children we're in this desperate, traumatized state needing help. And the brand came like this with the message of what the consumer was seeking. And so in our assessment, we identified their whole process was manual, which took a lot of time. They can't hire more staff. The clinicians were bogged down with emails, with responses with notes, with trying to get the right documents and stuff. So in our assessment, we identified some technology things that could be a pretty easy solve. We identified where their brand was not messaging and aligned to what the consumer needed. We identified that in the whole life cycle of this issue that they're serving, they were right here, but nothing before and nothing after. And so we helped them automate about 85% of their manual touch points. The things of getting this right document to the people at the right time, and then when they respond, it could automate an email, put them into the system, whatever. There was a lot of automation that we could do, and it was not very expensive. It was, you know, under it was under ten thousand dollars to do all of this work for them. We expanded their offerings so that they are helping the before during and after of this medical service. We improved their new client patient experience by automating it. There wasn't all the, hey, I didn't get that form or, oh, I haven't seen this or I didn't get this response. We automated that stuff so that the staff could just take that, oh, Sally, send her, just drag me right into another column and it would automatically trigger 
the letter that we needed, the next steps for them, the links on the website, all of that. And then we ended up saving 25 hours a month of manual staff time by this, by this automation of touch points. But we also in the process strengthened their brand, tightened up their messaging, it improved their close leads, they have more clients and their entire advertising budget is $1,000. So we have doubled their revenue in two years. Last year alone, they had a 42% revenue increase over 21, which already had been a more than 100% revenue increase. And so overall, they're up about 150% total revenue year over year. They have passive income and they have a more efficient system that can meet the needs, free up the clinicians to be able to take care of the care plans and the one-on-ones and the sessions with their clients. So the human experience is not only about the patients, and this is the second bucket of the trifecta. Patient experience, employee engagement, people matter. And more than ever, healthcare leaders have got to prioritize humans at every point in the organization. There is a massive exodus of nurses in healthcare. There's frustration, there's burnout, there's stress, there's fear of violence. There's so many things that healthcare leaders and employees are under right now. Another Omicron variant and the flu and now RSV and budget cuts and all the things. And it's so much stress that it's important that an organization not just charge off on making the patient experience better, but that they seek to understand the employee experience as well. So engaging and supporting your staff and caregivers is going to result in a better patient experience. It also has been shown to result in better quality of care better, higher safety scores and revenue growth. So it's important, it's a win-win to do both at the same time. I feel like one of the things that, you know, we have a huge system that we're working with. And one of the things that we're working on is internal communications. That is so vital. There was a study we saw a couple of weeks ago that talked about the chaos in organizations after the last several years. And the number one thing that more than half of the respondents in healthcare identified was that better communication would help reduce that feeling of chaos. It's internal communication is not just a newsletter. Internal communication is the foundation of employee engagement and of patient experience. If you can't effectively keep your staff informed, with authentic and consistent communication, you're not going to earn trust. And trust is what leads to loyalty. It takes time, which is why we say, don't focus only on the near-term quick revenue grab. You've got to do that. But you must stay the course on the long-term brand and communication play to ensure that your leadership, your culture, your communications, your reward systems your training, reflect the commitment to humans in the middle. And when you can get that right, that is what leads to greater profitability as an organization. So when we're helping people thrive in their jobs, some organizations leave that only to HR. And we believe that it is every people manager in the organization needs to be bought in. The resilience that you're looking for in your staff is about empowering them to do their work well. We, I'll share a case study in a moment, but it was the number one thing was the lack of empowerment, feeling like they didn't matter, that they were just a cog in a wheel, or they were had this responsibility and no authority to be able to execute on those initiatives. So those 
helping people thrive and build resiliency isn't about more time off, more snacks, the ping pong table. Those things are nice, but if you've ever heard of the book, Compassionomics, it is a book that is so powerful. It is written by physicians and surgeons for physicians and other providers. And it really is, they sought to demonstrate through scientific study, same exact rigor they would for a journal and a journal submission or a conference session. They did the same rigor on this study as they did for all their other, you know, new techniques in surgery kinds of submissions. And they were taking a look at the impact of compassion and empathy in healthcare, specifically on the resiliency and the burnout of physicians. They were exploring this physician burnout and the, the heartbreaking trends that are showing in healthcare. And they, they studied whole bodies of physicians, but then they also conducted specific scientific research around patients in palliative care, ones that are in stage four cancer diagnoses, others that are post-surgery, post-traumatic injury. They did all these bodies of research where they were identifying one whole body of patients with the same exact diagnoses, went through the list of, okay, these are the things the EMR says I have to say to you, blah, 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 blah. We've operationalized and systematized our things to improve the engagement. And this group had those things, but they added in specific statements of empathy and compassion. In some cases, the difference was less than three seconds of, of compassion at statements. In the stage four cancer group, the provider started with, I understand this is hard, but I want you to know you're not alone. We are here with you to walk through this process with you. That was the only difference in these, these two case studies with hundreds of patients. And guess what? At the end of the day, these patients that had just the four seconds of empathy or whatever had less pain, they were healthier and thriving more. They had better mental health and outlook on their disease. They had better recovery rates in some cases, and they had far fewer physician burnout in this category than in the one that just goes through the check, 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 check to get the, you know, whatever caps, the whatever survey it is you are serving, get all those things listed. And the difference in four seconds showed and demonstrated through research after research, the thing that providers are needing is not necessarily more time off to not burn out. What was missing was that connection to compassion the connection to caring. When their role got reduced to just widget, 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 they stopped caring. That's when they saw the burnout and the lack of resiliency skyrocket on providers and physicians and caregivers because they got into this for a heart reason to make a difference. And when the systems we have created have stripped it of all humanity, that has an impact internally and on the patient as well. So when you're helping people thrive, when you're building empowering systems for your organization, there are employee engagement strategies. There will may be communications and technologies that are involved. There needs to be an alignment of your brand and your mission. The mission statement shouldn't just be in your new employee packet once or on the wall. It needs to be aligned with your brand and marketing and the things that you talk about. And that's our next bucket. And then you need to enhance the culture. And I, where I see a lot of organizations fail, 
they get the buy-in of the leaders or HR or whatever, and they skip the people managers, that buy-in and accountability of the people managers to be the most loyal advocates for these cultural changes are really important. It can't be skipped. So a case study with a health insurer, we, I worked for a national Fortune 50 Medicaid health insurer. We provided Medicaid, extended Medicaid, individual family, foster care insurance. And we, we had some of the lowest employee engagement scores in the nation. Our member scores were terrible. The patients did not like working with us. And the providers who were part of our network, 70% had the intent to defect. They hated working with us. It was, so you get handed this, here, fix these. Okay, by the way, no budget. <laughs> and um, you need to do all three. So what we did was we took the NCQA, the CAP scores, the QRS, our National Employee Engagement Surveys. We took all the measures, you know, in a hospital setting, it may be press gainy, you know, caps, whatever, star ratings, all those things. Um, we took those, in the formalized feedback surveys, and we took a look across all three audiences, identified the things that are the direct reflection on net promoter score or likelihood to recommend, the likelihood to stay, kind of the communication, customer service, patient experience kinds of measures. And we found an almost 100% correlation across all three. When we dug in and unpacked, we realized and found out that the number one problem on all three groups, provider, member, and patient, and the employee was poor communication. It boiled down to that. So we set off onto a deep dive to understand the employees felt disengaged because they never knew what was going on in the organization, but they were the ones that had to answer the phone or the case management nurses were getting screamed at by patients because they got something in the mail and they had no idea. And so across the board, the gap in, in information and communication to the staff resulted in terrible communication to the customer and the patient. And that resulted in hundreds of complaints every month, many through the state insurance commissioner, some through legislative folks. Our grievance team was just buried. So the bottom line is that after really identifying and building a single source of truth, took us about a full year to get it completely right, um, where every individual in the organization had access to the latest information. They knew exactly where to find it and where to look. We trained every team in every area. They could keep up their own space as well. And then we identified We'll talk about it in the brand thing. Our brand promise needed to become more help and less hassle. So that became our external brand mantra, but it also became our internal brand mantra. We changed the culture. We changed the service design. We changed the script at the call center. We changed the member and provider materials. We changed how staff were trained and measured and in two years time, we had between 32 and 36% increase on those measures in two years. Now, if you listen to national survey folks like Press Ganey or reputation.com, whatever, they tell you, you can, you can probably influence a survey like that 1% in a year with massive effort. So to increase almost 40% in two years was mind blowing but essential to our survival. And I'll tell you what, our, our retention of patients went from 42% to 82% in two years time. It came from just focusing in on the consistent 
and trustworthy communication for all of our audiences. So growth of your, oops, excuse me, growth of your organization is in your brand and in your brand story. So all of these things are kind of the foundation, but the external growth that's going to draw people in is going to be centered on a brand and a brand story that is aligned to your commitment to do what's right for humans in your organization. You're not going to be able to compete on product and price in healthcare. Oh yeah, we got this robotic arm or we have this new urgent care clinic. Everybody has a new urgent care clinic, including CVS and Walgreens. So what is going to differentiate you is that experience and your brand story externally and internally needs to tell that story. So your brand promises are really, when you align that brand promise inside and outside, remember the more help, less hassle, that became our internal culture and our core values were woven into this program where people could spot recognize each other, where, you know, achievement awards, where bonuses, where whatever was aligned around demonstrating those core values to our client during the workday. So that was, we had to align it internal and external. We had to simplify what the heck is insurance? How do I access it? How do I know? Where do I go? And so we had to overhaul all of our external marketing. Instead of listing just program after program after program or benefit or service or location, which healthcare is so, so notorious for, we had to really get at what the client was craving, which was more help and less hassle. Yes, insurance has prior authorization. They've got this. Yes, healthcare has maternity labor and delivery, or they've got dermatology, or they have uh, urgent care. Yes, those things are necessary pieces of information, but they aren't meeting me where I am as the consumer. And so we had to switch our marketing to connect to what mattered to the consumer. And when we simplified our message, simplified our marketing, we exceeded our growth goals. We retained 40% more customers and we had people, including the state, looking to us for how to message this better across the state, not only to our customers. So the thing that's important in brand and marketing is that you know content builds relationship, relationship builds trust, and trust is what builds loyalty. So you have to be consistent. You have to be steady. You need to show up and be present. And I would say in a recession, this is where winners are made. This isn't a time to hunker down. All of history, Great Depression, 0809 recession, all of history, COVID, all of them, the people that hunkered, played safe, and waited till the storm was over are the ones that ended up going out of business or losing. The ones that instead chose to show up and be present consistently during these times of Difficulty are the ones that 100 years later are still the brand choice for consumers. Trust and loyalty are built in moments like this. So it's important. Your content isn't just a list of programs and services and locations. It is something that connects to what matters to the consumer and that it is consistent, it's reliable, and then I'll be like, oh, okay. Oh yeah, I remember seeing that ad for this hospital. Okay, my husband needs to have a surgery. I'm gonna check this hospital. That's how people relate and build that kind of awareness and trust. And then, you know, for us, the last thing I wanna say on this brand promise, and it happens so much in healthcare, how many of you marketing people have ever had a doctor come to you and say, my face needs to be on a billboard? Yes. Okay. 
The voice of the customer is what should guide your decision making, your strategy, your implementation, your tactics, what you're prioritizing. It's hard when the executives or the board or whatever are super clamorous and insistent on their way. And sometimes I get you have to kind of give and take on that, but make sure that you have the research, that you've got the data to share in those instances. And I'll be honest, occasionally I've been just overridden and told, just do it. Okay, I will put your face on a billboard. Knowing as a marketing professional, that's not going to be an effective approach, but sometimes you just have to do it. I pick the cheapest boards in the certain areas and put the face up there where he will drive by and see his face and that meets the need. But there are times when you as the advocate for the voice of the customer, for the patient, for the employees need to stand up a little, have data to back it and say, okay, I hear what you're saying and this is one approach, but here's what the data is showing me and an informed approach that we are recommending instead. So a case study with an ambulatory surgery center, we discovered that um, our, we actually got a call from a news outlet <laughs> that had it leaked from somebody from our corporate across the US that we were gonna be closed because of low volume. That's not exactly the kind of call you wanna get from a media member to be found out. And so in this process, we identified low volume in the outpatient clinic. Our surgery volume was down. We weren't keeping our physicians busy enough. We dug in and found out that in the process, we were getting hundreds of referrals every month. We had plenty of referrals, but of those referrals, 80% of them were wrong, stuff we don't even treat. And so, okay, there's one problem. We also found out in the greater community that people had, although we'd been there 85 years, between the two main hospitals in the town, they had no idea we were even in town. And the messaging that was out and about was just so medicalized and vague, nobody really knew what we did. So again, we had to take the whole brand, reduce it down to, okay, this was a pediatric orthopedic surgery center. And so rather than talking about osteogenesis imperfecta and the hip dysplasia and those things, people needed to understand what the heck do you do? Pediatric bone and joint injury. Pediatric bone and joint experts. So we took it from this orthopedic with the spelled with the A-E even, the old English spelling and osteogenesis imperfecta and the, you know, all of the technical diagnostic terms for what we do. And we reduced it in our external campaign to pediatric bone and joint experts, pediatric fracture care, expert fracture care, expert hip care, expert spine care. We made it as simple as possible. And guess what? In three months time, 200% increase in referrals to our outpatient clinic. We reduced the incorrect referrals by 80%. So in, rather than having 80% wrong, we only had 20% wrong. We increased the surgery census in a quarter, 60%. And in addition, volunteers increased, donations increased. We revised our physician outreach, recognizing that they didn't know what kind of referral. So we that was part of this process, but it was led from brand and our story and we did all of our entire brand expression, buses to billboards, to radio, to PR, to online, had this same simplified storytelling of pediatric bone experts. And it was wildly successful. And I will say 10 years later, that ambulatory surgery center, still thriving, one of the busiest in the system and basis of the work we did here is their number one service line 
in the hospital. It's, it is sustainable because we dealt with the provider experience, we dealt with the patient experience, and we dealt with the brand story that aligned expectations and that subsequently drove revenue. So before I go to questions, and if you have any, drop them in the chat, would love to answer questions. I want to just tell you a minute about Clarity PX. I promise I'll be fast. So we are a new agency. We're just two years old. I have worked more than 20 years in executive leadership in healthcare. I actually was a rehab and a rehab therapist to begin with, traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury and amputation. So I was a patient care provider. I've worked in hospitals and systems in marketing and experience and physician outreach, community engagement. I have worked for health insurance. We've worked for startups, for health tech, for biotech. And so we kind of have this unicorn view of healthcare. We've been in every stage and we understand the bigger picture and the pressures of each area and each initiative. We've led change management and leadership for large and small initiatives from a change of a revenue platform, coding the whole thing, all the documentation EMR, to smaller initiatives that have improved how the reception and the initial greeting of a patient changed in a small way, but made a huge difference on the scores. We've worked in rural to metro sites and we really have this full picture of, of what makes sense. We are a full scope agency. Our focus is to really support on strategy. We can help do that, implement, that assessment and prioritization for you that you take and implement. Or many folks come along and say, we need you to make our marketing dollar work. And so for some of them, we're executing their marketing, online, digital, social media, all of that. For some, we're doing brand activations like big events for them and really helping to show up in the donor and community engagement space. So we've kind of done it all. And that's a little bit about clarity. Our team is dispersed all over the U.S. And here's some of our clients and some of the places that we have worked. So that is today's presentation. I'd love to answer any questions if you have any. And if you um, think of it later, you're welcome to email me, sally at clarity-px.com. Find us online. We're on LinkedIn. We're on Instagram. Our website, clarity-px.com. We would love to, we would love to connect with you. I don't see any questions, but thank you so much for joining us today. If we can be of service to you, answer questions, connect you with resources, please let us know. We would love to connect. No heavy sales pressure. It's not the way we like to be sold to, so we never do it ourselves. But if there's anything that we can do to help explore with you, we, it would be our honor. So thank you. I hope that you have a great day.